Thank you, Jesus. Okay, let me just uh, share this really quick. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Well, it's exciting to be back in the house of God tonight. Although we actually never leave it because we are the house of God. But it's exciting to be back in Rochester again. We're thankful for the little break we had. Hallelujah. Let me just turn off my display here. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. So I just wanted to share this uh, message that the Lord gave me. And those of you that wanted to know what happened, some of the things that happened to us in Florida, you can watch Friday night's um, video. You can watch it on Facebook, on YouTube, and also on Rumble, because we are on Rumble as well. Um, but, you know, the first place that God has to restore is in the hearts and minds of his people, because that's where his kingdom dwells first, right? Is in the hearts and minds of us, and then also in the earth as we release it into the earth. So I just want to say hi to everybody out there. I love you guys. Thank you for your prayers. Um, thank you for your support, your partnership. Most of all, thank you for you, because it's your encouragement to us that keeps us going as well. So we want to honor every one of you. And today is another double-double. Today is for 2323. I love double numbers because the Lord speaks a lot in doubles to me. And uh, the first thing that I always think of when I see a double is we get double for our trouble. Because God always restores better than what was. He restores what? Brand new. And so we're not going back to the old we are in something brand new that is yet to be told. Why? Because we're the vessels of gold prepared from of old. God planned for our day. God planned for this time. God planned for the maturity of the times and the climax of the ages. I think we're in a climax, right? But you know, we don't have to be afraid because God knows what is about to be laid. Hallelujah. I um, am thankful I was born in this time because we are right on time. And every one of you are right on time. And every one of you can love your life right where you are. Why? Because you love the one that's in you that is a part of your life. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I wanted to share a few things, some message the Lord gave me for tonight. He said, Sue, I am going to restore your childlike faith and wonder in turbulent times. Because the first thing that we lose is our childlike faith, our first love, our wonder, the childlikeness. When we get into and we get our eyes on the world, that's the first thing that goes. As we get cynical, we get hard, we get mean, we get into unbelief and doubt, and we wonder why we have no faith, why bad things continually happen, and we get more cynical and hard, and God can knock on our door and we still won't hear him. And the Lord says, I want to restore my people's childlike faith and wonder in turbulent times. Is it any wonder that God would choose the decade of his rest to be in the decade of the greatest shaking that those of us that are alive have ever seen? God's kingdom is not like the world. It's not of this world. And he wants us to dwell in the kingdom and it's found in the mirror of the word. But we no longer believe the word. And he says, your delight is in me. Your awe and wonder come when you continually look to me and look at me. 
But when you take your eyes away and you look on everything happening around you, he said you lose your joy, you lose your peace, you lose your faith, and you start to complain and grumble and mumble and doubt, and you get hard. He said, I never said to my children, get hard. He never told us to get hard. He said, become like me. The world that already knows what life is like, it's hard. What they're looking for is an alternative. They're looking for what is real. How are they going to know what's real? When they look at us. If they look at you today, what are they going to see? That's something to think about. If people looked at you today, Mike, what would they see? If people looked at you today, Doug, what would they see? If they looked at people at you today, Amy and Michelle and all you guys, Noah, if they looked at you today, what would they see? See, God wants us to not lose the joy and the wonder and the childlike faith that he has put within us. Our focus is not on the kingdom of this world and the things that are always changing. Our focus is to be on him. And the more we look at him, the more we will become like him. And I never want to lose the childlike faith, the wonder, the awe of who he is. That's why I like being a blank slate, because I'm ready for an adventure every day. What are you doing, God? What are you saying, God? Where are we going, God? Don't lose that. Don't let people harden your heart. That's one of the warnings Jesus said is don't harden your heart. Fear, doubt, and unbelief will harden your heart. And then we no longer believe the promises that God has given to us. I never want to lose that. And so the exhortation is, he said, believe on me, not on the things in this world that you see. Believe on me. So while we were in uh, Florida, the, the Lord really began to draw my heart to go deeper into his, and to know what he thinks, what he thinks about, how he feels, what his plans are, what his desires are. Because when you begin to feel his heart, your heart changes. When you begin to feel what he thinks about, what he longs for, it begins to restore that longing inside of you. So, I want to go to, um, he told me, let's go to Proverbs 15.15. 15. Proverbs 15.15, 15, which is another double. I love double scriptures. You, wanna, you want an exploration? Look up all the doubles in the word. Proverbs 15.15. 15. says, all the days of the desponding and the afflicted are made evil by anxious thoughts and forebodings. But he who has a glad heart has a continual feast regardless of their circumstances. You can be happy in a hard situation. Because listen, situations don't determine your happiness. Jesus does. He is your joy. He is your strength, right? All the things the word says. He said, situations don't determine you, Sue. He says, your faith in me does. The joy of the Lord is your strength. He says, your heart is to have a continual feast no matter what's going on around you. And I'll give you a clue, this is true, because the minute you get your eyes off of him and you start looking at all the troubles around you, what happens? Mumble, groan, complain, doubt, mad. All the things that take away the joy out of you. And it drains you dry, right? 
He said, the days of the desponding and afflicted are evil because of anxious thoughts and forebodings. So why do we allow anxious thoughts to dry up our heart? This is where your feast starts. This is where your joy and your love starts, right here. Your thoughts will drain this dry. You have to guard your heart, Jesus said. He said, the feast is in you. Where do you think the banquet, the wedding supper is going to be? In the heart of the bride. Now, 15, Todd said something interesting. He said the number 15 means rest after extreme warfare. God is offering a rest in this decade to those that have been in extreme warfare. But that rest is in him as we begin to spend time with him and love on him and desire him and hunger for him more than these things. These things, actually, Jesus said, what did he say in the Gospels? These things will take care of themselves. All these things that you're going, they will all take care of themselves. But he said, you follow me. These things take your eyes off of him. He said, I'm calling my people back into their rest. It is a physical rest, but more of it, it's an emotional soul rest. He says, I want your soul to have peace. I want your heart to have joy. Because it's not an emotion, it's me. I want you to walk with me in the garden of your heart. I want you to return to Zion. Isaiah 66 says, if you go there, Verse 14, Isaiah 66, verse 14, says, actually, let's go to 13. As a mother, as one who is mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you will be comforted. And when you see this, your heart will rejoice, and your bones will flourish like green tender grass. And the powerful hand of the Lord shall be revealed and known to be with his servants. There's a key to healing right there. To walking in healing. Your heart, when your heart learns to flourish and rejoice and rest in him, even in warfare. When you learn to enter his rest in the test. Your soul and your body will have the best. This is what the word says. Your heart will rejoice and your bones will flourish like green tender grass. What happens to your body when you get out of stress? It heals. Do you know fear and stress cause most diseases are the root of it? Not all, but a lot of it. When our hearts learn to rest, our bones will begin to vibrate with life. I felt the Holy Spirit, because that word it says in the Amplify, what Sue Red Classic it said, the anxious thoughts and forebodings yeah. cause us to have those affliction and evil days. If I looked at the word foreboding, listen to this, what it means. To have a strong inner feeling or notion of a future misfortune, evil, or catastrophe. So in other words, that's the way you're thinking inside, is what that's saying. You're thinking inside that you're going to have a misfortune. You're going to have, you're going to get evil. You're going to have a catastrophe. See, that's what that means. Lord saying, and see in that scripture, so you look at it that way, see, all the days of the despondent and afflicted are 
partly forebode is because of foreboding, because of inwardly thinking you're going to fail, evil's going to come, you're going to have terrible things happen to you. Yep. See, that's what the Lord's telling us. That's why it says after that, yep. the glad heart has a continual feast regardless of circumstances. So in other words, don't let... See, circumstances cause you to think you're going to get misfortune, think you're going to get evil, think you're going to get catastrophe. That's what this is saying. It says, see, when you think that way, see, then you're going to get it. See, that's what the Lord's trying to say. He's saying, don't think of your future that way. No. Think of your future what? I'm going to get the greatness of God. I'm going to get the glory of God. I'm going to be delivered. God's going to do greater stuff than ever before. God has my promises he's given me, and they're going to be fulfilled. See, think that way. So the Lord's saying, watch your future thoughts about yourself and what's going to come in your circumstances. See, we got to think positively in our thoughts about the future because God's saying if you'll do that, that will bring the glad heart regardless of what hits your life. God does have a plan for our life, but it's up to us to cooperate with it. We can choose to not allow God to steer us and to bring us into that perfect plan, not as permissible and good plan, but ultimately it's up to us. He said, I want you to develop a simple trust yes, yes. and obedience and I want you to learn to be flexible in circumstances. He said, watch out for disappointment, because disappointment will harden you and make you rigid in circumstances to where you begin to have a heart of unbelief, and you won't think that it will ever change your life. Things will always stay the same. God wants to bring change, but change happens inside of us first. He, soared, he said, a simple trust releases the flow of my oil and my bomb. My bomb starts in you. Now, if you look up Jeremiah 8.22, it says, is there no bomb in Gilead, right? It's on your page I handed out at the bottom on the second page. Is there no fish physician there? Why then is the health of the daughter of my people not restored? In parentheses, it says why. Because Zion, because they no longer enjoy the presence of the great physician. So when we are angry, when we are resentful, when we complain, he says you're in the flesh, you've left the spirit, you've given yourself up to hopelessness and disappointment and you no longer enjoy the refreshing of my presence that renews you body spirit and soul he said your heart is to rejoice and your bones are to vibrate with life to flourish. That's why we can get younger, healthier, stronger, live longer. When we learn to draw from him what we need. Everything we need, learn to draw from him. As I drove to church today in my truck, I said, Lord, I'm tired. But you're not. So I draw my strength from you. And all my tiredness left. You know, we have to develop Every time you're hungry, don't you go to the refrigerator and get something to eat? So if you need something, just draw. Lord, thank you for your joy that gives me strength. Thank you for the food that you nurture us with in your presence. When Sue said that, the Lord reminded me of a prophetic word Lord's prophet Bob Jones got years ago, and he said, when we would cross over into the spiritual land of Canaan, God's land of his promises, he said in this vision, he said, I saw a freezer mm -hmm. in the vision. Yeah. And in the freezer, he said, I opened the freezer and there was ice cream. This is the vision of God. There was ice cream in the freezer. 
He said, I got the carton of ice cream out and it said milk and honey was the flavor of the ice cream. <laughs> that's what he said. <laughs> and the Lord, the Lord said, see, that's what I want you to eat in my land. Mil the land of milk and honey. See, I want you to have abundance. I want you to have glory. I want you to have greatness. I want you to have everything that you desire. That was the, that, and he said, the Lord said that that promise even included body parts, new body parts for people. His creative glory and power would be given in the his Lord's spiritual land he's bringing us into. So you need to think about that. Think, even when, you're, when your circumstance hits you, you need to say to yourself, Lord, I remember that vision of your prophet. I, I choose to eat the ice cream of milk and honey. Yeah. And when you do that, something will happen. You'll see. It'll bring you into that gladness of heart. Yeah. So the key to keeping your childlike faith and wonder in turbulent times is keeping that joy, that wonder. Yeah. Remember, every day is a journey, and you can choose to look at it in a dismal view, or you can choose to look at it like you're on an adventure. What are you doing, God? What are you saying, God? Where are we going, God? God likes that. Yeah. Yeah. Because we have a heart of what? Expectation. I expect change. Yeah. I expect freedom. Yeah. Joy will cause your heart to rejoice and your bones to flourish. Mm -hmm. Hear that? Joy. <laughs> Don't complain about how things are. Draw so that you become what things will be. Right? Okay. So anyways, he said, I want to restore my awe and my reverence and my tenderness to you and to one another. Because he said, my church is not tender to one another, they're mean. They're harsh, because they're a reflection of their heart. And when your heart is that way, you will treat each other that way. He said, my church is to be that balm of Gilead poured out to others, to be that rich balm to be that love, because my church should be enjoying my presence, and when you release my presence to others, it brings health and healing to them. So he said, cultivate your childlike faith again. Cultivate that awe and wonder of me again. Now, Mm -hmm. What I just did is I took like a uh, full toilet paper and I said, Lord, to, to, take, to take me and kill me is put it on me. Yeah. And I believe we're eating right now. Yeah. It's, it's by faith. Amen. So everything that we need is in Christ. So he said, I want to restore your childlike faith and wonder in turbulent times. Remember, seasons come and go. Turbulent times come and go. How many thousands of years has the church been on the planet? We're still here. We haven't died. I mean, some have, but we are the epistles that others will read. They are looking for hope, for peace. They're looking for healing. He said, your journey is a journey. It's a reflection of me. He said, go to Romans chapter 8. Verse 29. Romans 8, 29 says in the Amplified Version. Actually, let's look at 28 also. We are assured and know that God, being a partner in our labor, all things are working together and are fitting into a plan for good to and for those who love God and are called and according to his design and his purpose. Every day is a page in your book. 
It's all been planned out. He wants you to take a look. For those who he foreknew and of whom he was aware and loved beforehand, he destined from the beginning for ordaining them to be molded into the image of his son and share inwardly his likeness, that he might become the firstborn among brethren. And the Lord said, you are never to see yourself through the image of this world or this life because you are not that image. But he said, many of my people have conformed to the image of this world by looking away from me and entering into the fear and doubt and unbelief that is in the world. And therefore, their whole thinking has been shaped through hardship and loss and suffering that's in this world. They've lost their first love. They've lost the awe and wonder and joy of walking with me in here. He said, you are never to be conformed to this world and what's going on here. He said, your eyes are to be on me. If you look at everything that's going on in this world long enough, you will be conformed to it, and your heart will harden, and you'll lose your joy. Watch the news long enough. You'll be angry. I get mad when, I, when Pat turns it on. I put my headphones on and listen to something else. Your eyes, have, you have to keep your eyes on him. He is your joy. You won't get joy in this world, but you are to be joy to this world says here, you share inwardly my likeness. You are birthing the revelation of me to those around you. How are they going to find it if they don't see it coming out of you? Don't be like everyone else. Be different. He said, your journey will reveal the image that you have conformed to. I had to think about that. Your journey reveals the image you have conformed to. I think the church has conformed to the world long enough. Everything we do, we try to use the tools of the world to, perform, to promote the gospel, and it doesn't work. You have to use the tools of the kingdom to promote Jesus, and that works. He said, if I'm lifted up, I will draw all men unto me, right? So I handed out this paper, which I wrote out an encounter, and I want to read it to you because it's very important for what I just opened with. And um, the encounters that God gives me is because it is a picture of what concerns the Lord, his heart, and what he wants to do, and your part in it. That's why you all are here. So Jesus took me by the hand last night, and he says, Sue, let's go fishing. He said, the boats are all ready. Now, we know that Jesus said it's harvest time, and we are all harvesters, and we are all to fish for men. So we know, the, we know what the imagery is, right? So all of a sudden, I'm in this encounter, and I'm in this big wooden fishing boat that was waiting at the shoreline of the sea. And Jesus untied the rope that was anchored to the shoreline, and he climbed into the boat. Now, this was really real to me. The, bish, the boat smelled like fish and bait and ropes and seawater and everything. But in the encounter, I, I sighed and I smiled and I said, I love the sea. We climbed over the various nautical things lying in the boat and sat on the wooden platform by the mast with its white sails. I looked at Jesus and I said, if we're going fishing, where is the fishing gear, the poles and the bait and the things we need to catch fish? I don't even see any nets. Jesus just nodded and grinned, we don't need them on this trip, Sue. I've got another way that is more pertinent to your times. Come, let's go out into the deep. You know, Jesus does parables for a reason. Amer the American church is so full of knowledge. They've lost the revelation of the revelation. 
We think we know everything here. And he's saying, but you don't know it here. I want to restore the imagery of the truth. Why do you think Jesus spoke in parables, even to his disciples, and they didn't get it? And they lived with him. Why is it that we don't get it? We've lost the sense of awe and wonder if in our hearts. We've gotten hard. So somebody want to give um, Doc a paper back there, Pat, or somebody? Give, do you guys have one, Michelle? And, okay, give them those two. Give it to them, pass it to them. Okay. No, they don't. Give it to them. This is very important. Um, so he said, you don't need any of those things as we go fishing. We're going fishing in the deep. I'm in the first paragraph, and I did post this on my wall, guys, so you guys can follow along. That's watching the video. So we're in the boat, the fishing boat with the Lord. We're at the bottom of the first paragraph. And the boat started moving out on the waters. Suddenly, the sky darkened, and the water became choppy as the winds began to blow harder. I grabbed the bench tighter to steady myself and looked at the Lord who was looking steadily at the sea with a firm look on his face. The choppier the waters became, the more nervous I became. I said, Lord, are you sure we can fish in these turbulent waters? Jesus just turned to me and nodded. Oh, yes, the fish are ready to be drawn into the boat now. You know, it's amazing what a little turbulence in our life makes us really ready to get free. When it's easy and we're comfortable, we don't want to hear it. But all God has to do is shake our boat a little, and all of a sudden we're like, what do you got, Lord? Right? Okay. Then he turned and looked back at the sea, and I looked around me, and I thought, how will we draw them in? There are no nets. Suddenly I saw a fish jump in the turbulent waters. But this fish, was a, it was a really big fish, but it was grotesque and deformed. It looked sick or really aged. After this, more fish started jumping in the waters. Why? Because the waters were being stirred up. They were all the same, deformed and stressed or aged. Some were bent in unusual shapes. Some had large heads. Some were missing fins. I was amazed that most of these fish were messed up. <laughs> Some had a strange film clinging to them. They looked pale and sickly. Surely we weren't going to fish for these. The weather grew steadily worse, and I was clinging to the side of the bench, holding on to the mast so I wouldn't land on the bottom of the boat with the rest of the gear that was now being tossed around. Jesus took me by the hand and said, Don't be alarmed, Sue. This fishing trip is for all of you. Watch. See what I'm going to do. I looked out to sea again, and the turbulence was even higher. And there were so many fish jumping that it was almost fascinating to watch. But the fish still were all grotesque and misshapen, but mostly were sick, sickly looking with spots on them and cuts. Then I saw one of the jumping fish jump so high that it landed in the boat beside us. It was bent in its body and beat up and had six spots all over it. Its eyes were bulging and it was breathing wildly. But it looked at the Lord looking down at it. And I saw the most amazing thing happen. It seemed like the fish knew who Jesus was. And it laid quietly still at his feet in the bottom of the boat. I saw its breathing slow down and its color changed into a glistening silver. Its eyes no longer bulged out, and its physical shape relaxed, and it became a beautiful fish. I looked at the Lord in surprise. He motioned for me to look out to sea again. I looked at and was most alarmed because the most violent of storms had taken our ship really far out into the sea, and you could not see the shore anymore. I was quite alarmed. The Lord just smiled and said, the best part is coming up. Relax, Sue. This is going to be quite a haul. I was not sure how this was going to be a haul, 
but I nervously still clung to him anyways. The fish were jumping so much out in the turbulent waters that they looked like jumping beans. All of the fish were still misshapen and sickly. Suddenly, I saw another fish landed in the boat, and another. The same thing happened. When the fish landed in the boat, they each took on the same transformation when they saw Jesus in the boat, and they laid calmly in the bottom of the boat at the feet of Jesus and me. The more fish that landed in the boat, it seemed like the message was clear to the fish in the sea. Jump in the boat! <laughs> Suddenly, the fish were jumping in so much that our boat was filling up with wriggling fish who were unfolding, flipping, and changing all around us. I was so caught up in the spectacle that I did not see that the seas were beginning to calm down. We were sitting chest deep in fish. And Jesus was laughing merrily. I was not so happy about hundreds of fish squeezing in on me and smelling. I said, what is happening here? What are we doing with these fish? And are we going to sink now that we have a ship full of fish? Jesus looked at me and said, Sue, look at the fish all around you. I looked, and all the fish were now calmly laying there, breathing on their own. They were no longer sickly or grotesque or bulging. They had peaceful eyes, and they were being gentle and rest among us. Even though we were chest deep in fish, I could move my hands, and I lost all my fear. I knew we were not going to sink. I relaxed, and Jesus let go of my hand. He said, well, did you enjoy the fishing today? He did not give me time to answer that. He waved his arms. I want you to get this clear why I started out my message the way I did tonight. He waved his arms out to sea, and he said, this is the agitations of the nations in your day. The stress and the fear that comes from the world have affected the people until many no longer know who they are, but have been affected by the systems of this world and the societal changes being forced on them. Many hearts have hardened. Many minds have become bent and warped by trauma and pain. The thinking of many people have become calloused and cynical. When people lose their sight of me and when they no longer love the truth, they will be influenced and shaped by the world around them, and they will be tossed in their hearts and minds by the ever-changing influences and rulers of this world. This is not to be. Jesus said the shaking of this world will increase, but I am in the midst of these, and I will be found by those who are seeking for me. I am not far from any one of them said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and those who are seeking for me shall find me. The seas of adversity that you see here will also be the very place of my great grace. You don't need a fishing pole or a net to catch men, Sue. My presence will draw them. The harvest belongs to me. Now listen, I know where every fish is in the deep and I know each and every circumstance they are going through. I know just when to draw them in. Agitation is a great motivation as it awakens men from their slumber, and they begin to search for the truth again. Many are now looking for my rest. It's time for the realignment of the nations to accelerate even more. And the winds of change and the turbulence will increase as the nations wrestle for supremacy, but they do not see me. They will be unable to, to now listen, they will be unable to take control of what belongs to me. You guys don't have to be afraid. Watch now for what I do, what I will do, even among you, for this all belongs to me. I will fish among you all supernaturally, and you will see the accelerated transformation of all that enter my boat. I will set men free. As he was speaking, the waters grew calm, and the breeze became gentle, and the Lord was grinning wildly at me. 
looking at me covered in fish. He, had, he motioned at the large catch and said, Watch, this first catch is holy and it is my first fruits. It belongs to me. Suddenly the whole catch of fish vanished right in front of us. I stood up in the boat and looked around. They were all gone. There was no smell or sign of any fish at all. Jesus then stood up and said, this is what's important. The next great catches belong to all of you. Do not be influenced by the agitation that comes from the worldly events that you will see, but continue to keep your eyes upon me and upon what I am doing among you. The glory of my presence will increase, and those who are hungry and thirsty will be drawn to me. The greatest era of harvest and transformation is upon you. Love those who I send to you. Help them navigate the turbulent waters. Remember, you all are to heal them, deliver them, and set them free. Raise them up to also be fishers of men. Raise them up to be lovers of the truth. Raise them up to be worshipers of me. Raise them up to be free from fear this year. You are going to love this, Sue. Remember, I am always with all of you. One picture can tell us a thousand things. We can read the word all, light, all day long, but if you don't believe it and receive it, you won't conceive it. Don't let circumstances harden your heart. Remember a couple weeks ago when, I, when you were all got out of the boat and you were walking on the waters? He said, learn to walk on your circumstances. Your circumstances don't define you. Your circumstances reveal who's in you and how you walk in those and through those circumstances reveal who's in you. He gave me a scripture Daniel 7.2 says, I, Daniel, saw visions by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens, the political and social agitations, were stirring up the great sea, the nations of the world. Political and social agitations have no part in your heart. The kingdom of heaven is in you. And it's supposed to come through you. God says we would fish for men in turbulent waters. I think they're turbulent enough, but he says, my church has gotten her eyes off of me. She's lost her joy. She's lost her innocence and the childlike faith. But I'm going to restore it. Hebrews 12, 27 on the paper says, Now this expression yet once more indicates the final removal and transformation. It's not just about destruction, guys. God's not just going to destroy everything and boom, you're done. He said, you're in a reconstruction transformation generation. Reformation means I'm coming with salvation. Everything that can be shaken is going to be. Things that have been created in order that what can't be shaken will remain and continue. What is Jesus said? What is the only thing that can't be shaken? Who are the only people that cannot be shaken? That cannot be disturbed in their heart, in their mind, in their life? Those who have rooted themselves on Christ. Why are we so easily shaken? Why does our faith go up and down, sink and rise? Why can't we maintain our faith in him? He said, it's because of what you look at with your eyes. Of course, I read to you Jeremiah 8.22. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician? Is there no bomb in my church, in my people? Why is the health of my church not being restored? Because they no longer enjoy the presence of the great physician. You need to spend more time walking in the Spirit. Walking in love with Jesus. 
spending time with him, renewing your faith, renewing your heart, renewing your mind, your first love. If you've lost your childlike faith and wonder and you're cynical and hard and you're an agnostic, a pre-gnostic, and anything gnostic, you're caustic, you're toxic, you're heart sick. He says, I'm going to awaken your love. He wants to soften. Matthew 4, 19, of course, Jesus said to them, come after me as disciples. Let me be your guide. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. You have to let go of the steering wheel. Jesus didn't say, Jesus only said two words, follow me. Not steer me, control me, argue with me lose faith in me. He says, surrender. Follow me. I will set you free. How many want to be free? Especially in here. In here. Even in here. What did he say? Right, that's it. I'm going to say, let me go back to, I think it was. Let me find it. Hang on. Sue so can do it. <laughs> okay. Isaiah sixty six fourteen again. I'm going to comfort you. And when you see this, your heart's going to rejoice. And your bones are going to flourish like green, tender grass. And the powerful hand of the Lord shall be revealed and be known to his servants. Your joy and your health and healing journey starts in your heart. Because most sickness is, is caused by a root of fear and stress. 85% of germ diseases start by fear, when fear enters stress. God doesn't want us to be stressed. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. Yes. Your healing starts in your heart. I know many of us want our bodies to be healed, but you can't sustain physical healing unless your heart is healed and your mind is healed. It starts in your thought life. What thoughts are you thinking today? What's the pattern and cycle that you're stuck in? The biggest thing, this message that the Lord gave me this morning, he said, I want to restore your childlike faith and wonder in turbulent times. Why do you think the decade of rest is in the decade of turbulence around the world? Because this is what wakes the nations up. God wants us to learn to draw from him Oh, yeah, I had that. Thank you. Yeah. You're right. So Friday night during worship. Thank you. It was on my paper. I just bypassed it. Um, I was laying on the platform up here during worship, just closed my eyes, and I was just resting in him. And I saw this spiral staircase come down. And on them were all these angels that looked like children. They were small angels, and they were ascending and descending down upon me, down on my heart. And I knew that they were bringing, they were part of the process of restoration of a childlike faith and wonder in our hearts again. And again, number 15 means rest after extreme warfare. Bob always said, the church is going to have to learn to love. But God also said, you're going to have to learn to rest as I shake the world, as I shake society and the things that shake the hearts of men. 
Jesus said, you're going to see these things as I shake even more. He said, because the harvest, this is what's going to bring the harvest in. But we can't be shaken. If you're founded on the rock, you won't be shaken in your emotions, in your thinking, in your heart. You won't feel squeezed like a wash rag just wrung out with no life in it, no water, dry. You ever felt dry in your mind? You ever felt so dry in your mind? You ever felt dry in your heart? He said, draw from me. All that are hungry and thirsty, come to the waters and drink, and you will find rest for your souls, for your heart, for your body, where healing starts. Healing for your heart, soul, and body. God wants to refresh your faith, your awe, and your wonder. Now, it's, it's interesting. As Sue was um, sharing her vision, the Lord quickened this vision that Moore Cirillo had years ago to me, and then Sue literally just said his vision. I did? <laughs> you did? <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you. Now listen to this. I want, there's two parts here he shares. Just give me a minute here to find the other part here. Sorry, just going to take me a minute here. So I want to find the, the, the I found the one vision. But I want to find the second vision. Here it is. Okay. Here's the first vision. Lord, quicken this, these, two, these two visions to me. And Sue just said them, but it goes along with, she just said that the enemy's been wringing you out. Like I see all the water out of you. Now here's Morrisville's vision. 1982, October. This is a vision. In a night vision, Morsewell said, God showed me two hands, the enemy's hands, the devil, holding your life like a towel. What Sue just said. Trying to wring every particle of life, every ounce of strength out of you. See? God told me the devil was going to do everything possible to wring out your spiritual life to come against you, to come against your family, your finances, to come against you in the circumstances of your life. The message God gave for me was this, then was, don't give up. It's harvest time. I have seen your tears. I have heard your cries. Then he said, God said, let my people know that I have been mindful of the fact that they have stood on my word and that they have believed my promises in spite of the circumstances, in spite of the difficulties, in spite of the fact that on the surface it appears that I have not been faithful in answering prayer nor in keeping my word. Tell my people, I have heard their cries. I have, I have seen how they have hung on to my word, tell them I am going to answer their prayers. Once again, God spoke to me in a vision, and he revealed what he is going to do for you as his people. In this vision, I saw two great hands from heaven, God's hands, coming out of the sky, out of heaven, and they were dipping into the raging sea filled with God's people. The sea was very stormy and billowing, like Sue saw. And I saw those hands going down into that sea and picking up God's people and turning their lives around. God spoke to me and said, Son, it's harvest time. This is my people's turning point. I am going to literally reach down into the ravages of the seas of life, sea of life and pick up lives and turn them around. There is the word. So think about that. Now God quickened this to me when Sue, and then Sue just said it. 
same thing. The enemy, see, the enemy's been trying to do this. He's been doing this to God's people, but God is coming with his hands to deliver his people and deliver you, even though they're here and watching. Yeah. Glory to God. So he said it starts with a simple trust. Lord, see, trust isn't an emotion. It's a choice. It's a decision. No matter what we feel like, trust comes from the heart. He said, you say you believe in me, but he says, do you trust me? He said, do you trust me enough to let me work this out for you. So you have, to, you have to begin to open your heart and trust. I know a lot of people have been discouraged and feel defeated. And um, we've been, he said, you must open, do you trust me enough to open your heart to me again? See, God is not a man. He doesn't lie. But we get hard in our minds because of the things that we've gone through. But he said, when you trust me, that's when healing comes. Because he said, I am the balm of Gilead. I am the healer. I am the restorer. He says, I want to restore your simple trust. I want to restore flexibility. I want to restore hope in you. He said, hope is the rope that will, carry, that will lift you out of the sea, out of circumstances in which you've sunk. He said, don't sink. Don't think. Sometimes our mind is our worst enemy. He says, I'm a companion. I'm in you, number one. You're never alone. I'm with you. I walk with you through life. I'm also for you. And so there's a softness that's going to come as the shaking increases. And God wants you to know the freedom and the joy of restoration and healing. Because we are so going to change that people are going to look at us uh, another time they're going to look back and they're going to say, what has happened to you? And we can say, not what, who? Because he's our life. And your life starts inside. And then it works its way outside of you and changes everything in your life around you. So, what is this? Okay. So when the Lord said, I want to take you fishing, see, he gives me these encounters because they're messages of hope to the worn-out church. Because we should not be worn out. We are in the decade of his rest. But he said, simple trust will restore your rest. Your eyes are on the world and on your circumstances, on your family, on your finances, and on your job, and everything else that you think is always going to fall apart. He said, no, get your eyes on me. I will suddenly transform you. When people look at your life, what do they see? Who do they see? He said, you're the epistle that people are going to read. And what they read in you, will it meet their need? Jesus is your story. You're born in this world for his purpose. Your journey will reveal the image to what you have conformed to. I'm going to change the image. Your image of who you think you are, of what you think your life is. See, your life was written in his book, not yours. Throw your book away. He has a better story that he wrote for you. The problem is we don't believe it. 
You're not meant to live in defeat. You're meant to sit in his seat. Sit. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places, right? Thank you, Jesus. Healing starts in your heart and in your mind and in your body. You're going to so change and be so transformed, you won't even know yourself. If you will trust him and let him in. You have to let Jesus in. You have to trust him. He won't fail you. And every one of you watching tonight online, you were here by God's design. You are the fishers of the harvest. You are the harvesters. And we are just at the beginning of the greatest shaking any generation has ever seen. Why do you think God chose us to live in this day? Jesus said, you are, think about this. Every one of you, think, think about this statement. You are the best of your generational line. What, me? I'm a mess. <laughs> That's what you think. You are the best seed of your generational line. Now this afternoon, before I came to church, I had this vision. It was interesting because I was on the top of the mountain and I had these containers and my children were, my four kids were in front of me and I was giving them their inheritance. And it, was, it looked like, um, you know how the lunch boxes today have these separate little compartments? Like a, a drawer organizer? And it had all these compartments, and in there was their, their ID, like I had saved their, it wasn't a birth certificate, but it was like that. And I had saved different things for them, and I was giving it to them. And I was telling them, this is everything that I have saved up for you, I'm passing to you now, and I release it to you. And now you will choose what you're going to do, because the generational blessing and inheritance I now pass to you. And I gave each one their little drawer thingy. And the enemy was mad. <laughs> because some of those compartments, the, one of those, um, the ID was their identity. God's going to restore their identity of who they are, of who he caused them to be. And right now, our generation has no clue. They don't even know what they are, if they're even human or not. God wants, is going to release an encounter, a revelation to our seed line that is going to so root them and ground them in who they are, they won't be conformed to this image of this world anymore. Now, when you said that, the Lord said that what he showed you is what Jacob did mm -hmm. at the end of his life. Yeah. He brought his, the tribes before him, and he gave them all a prophecy. Mm -hmm. And they told them all their destiny, what God had promised them. So that immediately came to me when Sue was saying that. And that's what I was going to say next. <laughs> because each one of my kids, so to speak, that I had given their drawer to. Um, I also released the generational blessing to them that they were to inherit beyond me. Because this generation has not only a struggle with identity, they don't have a view of destiny. They don't have a view of their purpose beyond this earth, the reason why God put them in the earth. And as I did, I gave them admonishment of all, if you read through the Old Testament, even the New, when the fathers were about to leave, they always gave each child a promise, a rebuke or a correction or something. And they urged them to walk with the Lord, to follow his voice, to listen to him, to walk in him, with him all their days. And... Um, that's what I was doing with each child. 
Well, they were adults, but the very thing that angers the enemy more is that we have it, we get, we restore our sense of purpose and destiny that comes from God. And so as I was standing on the mountain and I released all four of my children when I was done, the, gener the generational blessing and deposit was released. And I know it was a picture of what God is doing right now. This generation is going to erupt with a revelation of their God-given purpose and identity. And also, not focus on generational curses so much as the generational blessings that are passed down from generation to generation. When Bob Jones went home and Jeff Jensen went home and all these others are going home and Charles Stanley and everybody else, what are we going to do with what's being entrusted to us? True. They left a legacy behind. And now what are we doing with it? There is a blessing in inheritance. And one of the inheritances is the harvest. We were born in this world for God's purpose. And that's why most of the church struggles. They don't even know their identity. They don't know their purpose, their gift, and they're running from this place to that place to this conference to that person, trying to figure out who they are. When the Father of all is saying, come up here. <laughs> Open your heart. Trust me. I will satisfy and straighten all those things out that you don't understand. And today, on 423.23, a double, God began to, through that encounter, pass to the sons their inheritance, their identifications, the deposits and things that are being passed to them so they can run. And I said, now go run and have fun. Our purpose is to pass on the legacy. Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and possess the earth and then fill it up. You inherit the earth. God just doesn't want us to see the destruction of the earth. He said, no. He says, my kingdom goes on and on. I am in a construction phase. Everything I shake is going to crash and tumble, but then... Those who cannot crash and tumble are going to remain and continue. You have a purpose here. Inspire hope in people. Inspire faith. Inspire love. Trust. Healing will erupt in your body and mind if you will open your heart. Because that's where all healing starts. And I had such a sense of destiny when I did that. It was so real. And when the last one left, I turned and I looked to the Lord. I said, it is finished. I said, it's finished, God. I released the generational blessing down to my family line. And now I can rest in you. It wasn't the burden for my kids because my kids are already belong to Christ. We have to trust our kids, trust Christ with our kids. You can't control them. They have to find out who they are, and the journey can't start till you let go of them. They have to walk their faith. And so I look to the Lord. Yeah. And there was such a joy and the Lord was so excited because guess what part of the healing of the nations is going to be? Fathers and mothers blessing sons and daughters and also turning the hearts of the children to the fathers and the fathers to the children. And when they all four left to run the race in the, in the vision, I knew that there was a launching of this generation, the one that's going to come after us, began today on a 2323. 
there was a release. And there's going to be such a grounding, there's going to be, it's going to be astounding. The most radical, fanatical miracles you ever saw start with the generational blessings being passed. And I have such a hope for the future and such a joy for God's plans because he wrote this time that we're born in. He knows what's going to happen. We can trust him. Because why? You're the answer for many that are in the turbulence. You're the answer for them. Reach out to them and love them. Care for them. Spank them if they need it. But don't lose your trust and your awe and your joy. So I was telling the Lord on my drive here, I was thinking about when I passed out their drawer to them. I said, Lord, my joy is complete. I already sit in my seat there, but my joy of having released a legacy and what that meant in the spirit was this generation has to have their own revelation, their own encounter. And when I released that legacy in the spirit, I knew that this generation belonged to the Lord and they would find him. And they would not be conformed to this world, but they would actually come out of the turbulence and they would be the greatest of our family lines beyond us. But they're not getting my part. <laughs> I have such excitement for the future because God's not done. And guess what? The enemy never wins. God created the devil. He is not God. And he cannot go beyond his role. God created the end and the beginning. God created your scroll. Start believing in it. Start believing in him and believe in you because you have a purpose. God called you and he loves you and he wants you to be strong and have courage and joy and trust him. He will always provide, and he will always guide. So um, I feel like we're going to pray for everybody tonight. We're going to release a generational blessing on you. And, well, part of the generational blessing is healing. <laughs> Right? Miracles, provision, joy. It's time for the blessings of God. Why? Because if you have no hope, what can you give others? There is a purpose for your life. And you're going to find it. You're going to believe it and you're going to walk in it. But you have to trust them. All of you. We're going to release the generational blessing. You're not cursed. You're blessed. Thank you, Lord. So before we do that, like Pat said, because I forgot, we'll take an offering. Um, if you'd like to give, you know where the bucket is. Give to the Lord. If you found value in this message, give into your own life. Give in to the word itself. So to the Lord and watch him increase it. You know how to give. The link's in the video. You can give through PayPal, Cash App, GiveLify, um, Facebook Messenger. <laughs> uh, make a check out the SOG. You can mail it to us even. There are some people that don't like electronics. You can even send it to the church. Thank you, Father. You know, the deepest place of trust starts with your finances. Because if you can't trust God in your finances, in your heart, 
you'll never break free. I broke that fear a long time ago. He's my supply and provider. Where your money is, that's where your heart is. Where your fear is, that's where your money is. Why is it that way? I don't want my heart to be in fear. Money doesn't determine my heart. Money's just a tool. God has lots of tools. Hallelujah. So, who wants a generational blessing from the Father? You know, you have an inheritance. All of you have an inheritance. And the reason why I say that is I'm not just blessing you with a blessing. God wants you to know your purpose. The purpose he has designed just for you. Not to know it here. Stop thinking. Let it come out of here. Our biggest struggle is this. It's in the way. Our biggest battle is in our thinking, our thoughts. He said, Sue, I didn't call you to think. I called you to surrender. <laughs> and then I found the greatest freedom I've ever had in my life. And it doesn't, it isn't determined by circumstances. He is my life. He is my joy. And your lives are going to change. The way you view yourself is going to change if you will trust him. The way you think about yourself, about your family, about your future is all written by Jesus. But he said, but do you believe it? Do you believe who I am, number one? And if you do, then why do you doubt what I've written about you? I said, boy, that's true, Lord, I do. He says, then stop. Stop doubting me. I don't fail you. You fail you. Stop failing. He says, your faith, Jesus said to Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail, but your faith would prevail. Yes. Jesus knew Peter was going to fail. He was going to doubt, get in fear. But he said, I prayed that your faith would not fail. I love Noah's name because Noah is a promise. Levi. Or Levi, Noah. I always say Noah. You know, there was a boy in Florida called Noah. Hang on, there was a boy in Noah in Florida called Noah. And there's a promise. Even if we think it's the end, it's not the end. It's the end of an era, an end of an age, an end of a season, an end of a page, Levi. But it's not the end. God gives us a beginning, a new beginning, a fresh start, a reset. And so, how many here have hope for the future? You know why? Because you're the answer for the future. And God wants to give you a view of how he's going to use you to shape the future for the generations to come. You're the best of the family line. Are you kidding me? He said, yeah, you're the best. You're the best of your family line, but you don't believe in you. You look at yourself through a distorted mirror because you look at yourself through the image of the world and of failure and, dis and disappointment. He said, look into me. You're going to be surprised what you see. There's an encounter coming to every one of you. It's going to so revolutionize you. <laughs> I'm ready for that too. Hallelujah. So, Pat and his uh, well-traveled prayer cloth, show him your prayer cloth, Pat, has been around the world. 
But there was such a fresh impartation from Lakeland in Florida, not from Todd, from God. There was such a refreshing it's true. Amazing. that it gave me great hope because it doesn't matter how long we wait for promises, even in this city, God's moving. But part of the problem is we don't see it because we really don't want to be it. And so you have to change your attitude. And Jesus said your attitude is in your thinking. Change your mind. Change your thoughts. So we're going to lay hands of your anoint, every one of you. Because you're all of my kids. You can't get away. <laughs> I love to say that because I'm a mom. And everybody that walks in that door is my kids, even that one. Because <laughs> why? Why? And I mean this. Why, Levi slash Noah? Because we're family. Remember that we are family. And we can trust. So, Father, I pass the generational blessing on to my daughter here. Lord, your heart of love, worship where she or her heart has been dry and worn out and wrung out, and she's been wandering in a dry land. Let your deep, deep well spring up inside her mind and heart. Lord, let a refreshing start, a replenishing a renewal. Lord, let there be a birth of her worth that she will finally find herself in you. Let a reset. Lord, I pass the legacy that comes from you into her, that she will run her race with joy and fire and extravagance and outlandish miracles, because she really is radical inside, but part of her has died because of people trying to conform her to what they think she should be. But we just take that off of her now. And Lord, let there be a blooming in her heart. Give her a dream and encounter with you. And let the refreshing do that comes from you just restart her heart, restart her vision, her hope, her purpose, her identity, and her legacy. Father, I thank you for coming as the spring rain. Coming, Lord. Let her hope be renewed. That fresh vision and joy and that adventure that she's been longing for for a long time. Let that sense of adventure just begin to break out. And maybe she'll go camping with Sue, too. <laughs> you know, we have, to, we have to have a sense of adventure. Christ loved it. And it's okay to want to have adventure. It's okay. We were made for that. So, Lord... Let her life begin, and let healing water her, so much so she can't hold it back anymore. In Jesus' name. Yeah. So, Father, That's the truth. <laughs> let this son run with the vision that you have put in him the purpose you have held him in reserve for. Not just a fresh start, the true start. Lord, let there be a resurgence and an emergence in the new season of the true that you have prepared him for. Father, a new door, a new floor, Father, that he is meant for in this time. He already has the key. And let the door open, Father. You have called him to wealth and health. You have called him after a season of stealth. 
You have called them now to come forth, to recharge and to re-energize and to rekindle vision into this generation to come. Father, thank you for destiny. Thank you for the angelic assistance and the promotion that comes from your hand. Now let his inheritance expand. <laughs> let all Levi. But you know, there is a Noah in all the kids nowadays because they're born for a future that no man can see. Noah survived the flood, but he thrived in the flood and he went on, right? And there is a deposit in the children today that their lives aren't tied to the turbulence. They ride upon the waters of the yeah. sea and the ark of Jesus. Yeah. And they're going to go beyond and further than this generation will because they're going to have a revelation that comes from heaven. And so Lord, we pass the baton to them. And Father, we join our faith like the cloud of witnesses that have joined their faith to ours so we can run. We pass the baton to him that he will run and he will fulfill the purposes that have not yet begun but are right ahead. So, Father, let him be divinely led in Jesus' name. <laughs> only, only grandmas can call you Noah. <laughs> no way. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for the steadfast one that continually looks into the window of the sun. This little dove who flies every day looking for the window in the skies that will open her way. <laughs> Angels looking down to see if she's looking up. Angels continually filling her cup. Lord, let her release bread from heaven. Let her release wisdom that will counter the leaven. Let the oil of the Spirit renew her every day and let her water many along the way as she faithfully stands and prays. Lord, I thank you for miracles Miracles every day as she just simply obeys. Let the healing waters break out so she will finish what she is called to do. And her legacy will follow her all her days and even beyond these days and the generations to come. I see you skiing down a mountain, a really high mountain. And it's not regular skis. They look like um, a combination of a snowboard with wheels, like a skateboard snowboard. <laughs> and you have an ability and a creativity inside of you that is not linked to one generation. There is a momentum that is going to be go beyond your ability that's going to give you mobility. And you're going to be able to ascend the heights and go into the mountains and go into the valleys and go into the streams. And you're even going to understand their dreams so that you can bring a restoration of vision to the generations that are young and old. There's a restoration of the generation that has fallen down Generations that have laid fallow, that have been empty. But you're going to have understanding and the compassion to bring forth the truth in a way that will cause an acceleration in their walks even today. Lord, I thank you for the gift of hope and grace to encourage many that are in a turbulent race that she will spur them on and cheer them on so that they can fulfill who they're called to be. I thank you for the deposit of this mother 
even in one that is young. And Lord, I thank you for refilling her and giving her strength and great courage that she will be one that will cheer many and root for them so that they too can win. <laughs> Lord, I thank you. <laughs> he's a father, he's a grandfather, but he's also a son. And he still is struggling on how to run. And he's lost his sights on how to have fun. So, Lord, I thank you for breaking open the waters of his youth, breaking open the waters of his childhood, breaking open the waters of even when he was a seed in your hand. Lord, that you will catch him up to, so that he can understand you have a plan, and he will have the joy and the freedom and the sense of adventure that he longs for in this day. Lord, let there be in a return and excitement and vision, even for the future, even of his children and grandchildren and the ones after that, that this father and grandfather can deposit the generational blessing into them. And he will know what to give. And he will know his part. And he will have deep, radical joy, even in his heart. Amen. Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father. Sometimes we don't remember who we are. But in this season of awakening, you said, Father, that you are calling out to us, remember who you are. Remember who you are. There's such an awakening of destiny, Lord, and the purpose you have called Mike for, that he yet still does not understand, even though his earthly father is not here, and even though he might not have the upbringing that he longed for or needed, but Father, in you, Father, let the healing waters begin to flow into Mike, into his memories, into his childhood, even into when he was a seed in your hand. Catch him up so he will understand your plan for him, that he will begin to flourish. And with great joy, he will harvest all around. Great joy, exceeding joy accelerated joy. I thank you for the joy of his healing, the joy of the healing of his mind, the healing of his heart, the healing of his body right now. We command healing now to start. Lord, I thank you for great joy and great miracles in this boy. In Jesus' name. <laughs> oh, Okay, stay right there. So we just released a generational blessing to Bill O'Meara. Yes. To his mind, yes. his body, and his spirit. Yes. We call you, Bill, to remember who you are. Yes. To remember your faith in God. Your faith in the Word. Your faith in his faithfulness. Yes. Your faith in his healing power. Yes. Your faith in his love. Your faith in his heart. Lord, awaken his heart to the reality of love. For your love is what heals us and sets us free. Bill O'Meara, remember your destiny, your legacy, and your inheritance in me. You are a son. You belong to me. And Father, I thank you for a restoration of his memory. I thank you for a restoration. I call his mind, his heart, and body back to his station, back to his scroll, back to his role. Remember who you are and be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. <laughs> thank you. Wow, there's difference in here. Yeah. For you too. Oh. <laughs> Good hat too. Yeah. Come here, Pat. Okay. Hallelujah. Bring it on. 
<laughs> I felt like it was supposed to be a prayer, but I don't know. Okay. Is it okay if I pray for you, too? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Jesus, I just thank you for the two of them. I thank you that they allow themselves to be open vessels so they can hear directly from you and be so accurate every time. <laughs> They know exactly what they're talking about and they're hearing directly from you every single week, week in and week out. And we're just so thankful that we have a place to come to and that you too are obeying God and listening and hearing and he's using you. Amen. Amen. (laughs) We release blessings, blessings, generational blessings. But you got to realize we are family and we're all walking the same journey together. True, true. And the biggest thing that helps us all is to remember we're not alone. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. The whole body of Christ is going through the same transformation process, whether they feel like they're alone or not. God is making a people ready. He's making the bride ready. He's making us ready for whatever he has planned. But the biggest thing that gives us hope and faith is knowing that we're together, that we're not alone. And we can encourage each other in our journey because that's what being the church is about. We change together. Yep, he's all right. (laughs) You're okay. It's going to be fun, isn't it? Uh That's right. And we love you. And we're always here. Pens are always here. And guess what? No more fear. Amen. That's it right there. No more fear. Because God is here. And we're family, and we're going to get, we're going to get, we're going to get it together, right? Because that's where we draw our strength from, is from him and from each other. Yeah. And we love you. I love you, too. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> All righty. Awesome. That, I, it feels different in here. It, it feels does. bright. It does feel bright. Ah. It's good. Hallelujah. Phew. You've had a big fight, but your future is bright. You're going to see yourself, Brent, through different eyes. Yeah. Because God always faithfully supplies, always. He said to me one day, he said, Sue, you belong to me. Do you think I would fail you when you belong to me? He says, no, I am jealous over what belongs to me. I will take care of you. And I think that's the biggest thing that's given me courage is every day I know he takes care of me. And I can trust him. So... Trust and have fun. And let God out, and it don't matter what people think you should do and be. Be you. Be you. Be that radical, fanatical girl that's hiding in there and afraid to uh, give herself a voice. You do have a voice. And you do hear from God. And you do feel him. You know him. Don't be afraid. Be brave. That's why he calls, told me to call myself Susan the Brave, because I wasn't. I was very intimidated. And uh, because of the abuse I went through most of my life, I was always told I couldn't say nothing or do anything or whatever. He says, I want you to call yourself Susan the Brave. So all through, down through the years, Susan the Brave. And then one day he says, now you're brave. He says, now you will never fear again. Because now you know who you are. I called you to be brave. He said, that's why the angels come and say, be strong, be of good courage, do not fear. Be strong, be of good courage, do not fear. Have joy this year. (laughs) Why? Because circumstances don't determine your joy. He does. He's your joy. And you can bubble over in the circumstances, and the circumstances says, I'm out of here, man. I can't take that joy. And actually, the devil will flee because he can't take it. <laughs> That's, true. That's true. He can't That's take true. it. That's exactly true. That's right. Joy is your, strength. your joy is your strength.